Good afternoon. I'm pleased to be here to be part of this WebEx and present on a report that was recently produced. The uh, report uh, that uh, the is a joint report by the Public Health Agency of Canada and the Canadian Institute for Health Information, and specifically the Population Health uh, part of CAIHI. The report is entitled Obesity in Canada, and we released it at the CPHA conference in June of this year. I didn't put information in the slide deck on CAIHI or CPHI, so I'll give you a, a couple of uh, seconds on that. CAIHI, or the Canadian Institute for Health Information, we are an independent, not-for-profit organization that provides essential data and analysis on Canada's health system and the health of Canadians. And CAIHI was formed in 1994. So CPHI, which is the Canadian Population Health Initiative, we're a, a, we are a branch within CAIHI, and our mission is really to look at understanding factors that affect the health of individuals and communities and to contribute to developing policies that reduce inequities and improve the health and well-being of Canadians. You may remember a couple of reports that uh, we produced in CPHI on obesity previously. There was one in 2004 entitled Overweight and Obesity in Canada. It had a bit of a nickname called the Big Fat Obesity Report, and we had commissioned Kim Rain to work on that one. And then in 2006, there was an Improving the Health of Canadians report called Promoting Healthy Weights. So this report that I want to talk about today is entitled Obesity in Canada, and um, we'll uh, get into the meat of the report. This uh, slide has a listing of our peer reviewers. We wanted to thank our peer reviewers who always give us good comments and direction on where our reports are going. So the outline that I wanted to bring to you today is has a number of different uh, parts uh, in the report. One of the uh, things we looked at was prevalence of obesity among adults, children and youth, and Aboriginal peoples. So this had both new and existing estimates. Another section was looking more at the determinants of obesity, and there's a, a new way we looked at uh, uh, the impact of modifying determinants. And the next section was around health and economic costs of obesity, and finally, opportunities for interventions. So this is going to be the frame that I use to present our report to you today. So the first one we're going to talk about is prevalence among different populations. So specifically for adults, you'll find in the report, and this will not be a surprise for any of you, that more than one in four adults in Canada are obese. And that's based on the measured heights and weights used uh, for 2007 to 2009. So when you look at the self-reported height and weight, uh, you, you won't again be surprised to realize that the obesity reported is lower, 17.4%. It was interesting, one of the things we did in this report was looked at obesity rates for health regions across the country. So um, we had a variation of 5.3% in Richmond, BC, up to as high as 35.9% in northern Saskatchewan. So a six-fold difference across this country, and when we released this report, we got interesting uh, pickup on the media with, with these particular rates, because everyone was interested to see how, what theirs was and how it compared to other people's. Interesting that this variation in obesity is similar across OECD countries, and it ranges from, for example, 3.4% in Japan to 34.3% in the U.S. We also found that obesity tends to increase with age, up to age 65, and whether males or females are more likely to be obese depends on the population and the measurement. So there's still some, some differences out there in the data that we need to be looking at. So now we'll turn to children and youth. Uh, interesting that uh, when we looked at measured obesity, uh, for obesity it was 8.6% for those aged 6 to 17 years of age and 6.3% for age 2 to 5. So there are different systems for defining obesity, but when you look at all the measures, we can see that certainly the prevalence has increased over the past 30 years. And specifically among youth, uh, measured obesity tripled. Um, between the years of 78 to 79 and 2004. And when you look at the self-reported heights and weights, it's interesting that it's remained stable among youth aged 12 to 17. And again, we found that obesity tended to be more prevalent among boys than girls. There's lots more information in the report on all of this, but these are just the highlights. Another part of the report, we did look at Aboriginal peoples. We were um, fortunate to get our hands on some data, a number of different sources of data. We used the Canadian Community Health Survey. survey. We used the First Nations Regional Longitudinal Health Survey, the Aboriginal People Survey of 2006, the Nunavut Inuit uh, Child Health Survey, and region-specific surveys. 
So taking all that information together, what we reported on in the report was that 38% of off-reserve Aboriginal adults were estimated to be obese, and that's based on, on measured height and weight. And when you look at self-reported, you can uh, see the differences here. So 26% of off-reserve Aboriginal adults were estimated to be obese, and then we have specific breakdowns for Inuit, First Nation, and Métis. Uh, we also have some information in there around obesity in children and youth for, for the Métis, off-reserve First Nations, and Inuit. A uh, little more information on Aboriginal peoples when we compared Aboriginal to non-Aboriginal populations. Uh, prevalence, pr the prevalence of obesity was significantly higher for Aboriginal compared to non-Aboriginal populations. And it was showed up particularly in Alberta, Manitoba, Ontario, and Quebec, but not in, in Nunavut. Um, so, however, uh, among off-reserve Aboriginal adults in BC, obesity is lower than for uh, all of Canada. So again, it depends on the population and where they're, where they're located. We did uh, identify some limitations when we're looking at obesity for Aboriginal peoples, and one of them is the fact of the measure, the body mass index that we use. It may not be the best one for Aboriginal populations, as it may overestimate obesity-related health risk, particularly among the Inuit. And as I mentioned previously with my list of data sources, there's no one data source for information about obesity among First Nations, Inuit, and Métis. <clears throat> now I want to go on talking about the determinants and contributing factors as another section in the report. So this particular slide uh, looks at income, but uh, we looked at a wide range of genetic, lifestyle, social, cultural, and environmental factors that contribute to variations in obesity. And again, these differ by population. <coughs> so what this shows is that lower levels of income, and we also found it for education, you'll see that in the report, that uh, lower levels of, of income it is a risk factor for both Aboriginal and Aboriginal females, but again, there was no clear pattern for males. So this specific graph shows females. Uh, this is another one looking at a different determinant associated with obesity. Um, patterns of obesity are complex when you look at geographic areas. So this particular one looked at different uh, census metropolitan areas in the country. And in most cities, obesity was more prevalent in the most socioeconomically deprived areas than in the least deprived. So if you see the second uh, graph, the one around Halifax, you can see that for Halifax, over a quarter of those in the lowest socioeconomic areas were obese, compared to just over 1 in 10 in the highest socioeconomic areas. However, in other cities, if you look at Vancouver, for example, there were no significant disparities found. So again, it depends on the area. Now the next, this next graph is a, is a little bit of a complicated one. This study, we tried to look at multiple factors associated with obesity and how they're interconnected in a model. So assessing the population attributable risk and the estimated number of cases of obesity that could be prevented with changes to that particular determinant. So um, if you look at the, the results here, you can see physical activity had the strongest association with obesity at the population level <coughs> for both sexes and adjusting for other factors. So what that translates to mean, so it's estimated that an equivalent of 20% of obesity in adult women, this one specifically for women, could have been avoided if the inactive population was active. However, it's also important to note that other social determinants, such as low income, rural residents, etc., were associated with increased obesity as well. So and you'll see as you look at the report, the, re the results and the impact of different determinants were different for men and women. So income was not uh, significant for men, and low fruit and vegetable intake was associated with higher risk of obesity for men when you compare it to women. The next section looked at health and economic implications, and um, you can see here that, uh, and, and it's no surprise to any of you, that obesity significantly increases the risk of several chronic diseases, so things like type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease, cancer, osteoarthritis, and psychological health. And the risk of death appears to be greatest for those who are extreme weight categories, whether it's underweight or obese. 
So the uh, availability of Canadian data on long-term health impacts of obesity is rare, especially when we're looking at children and youth. So when we looked at the literature and tried to get some information on health and economic implications, looked at a number of different studies. Some of them looked at combining uh, obesity-related chronic diseases, looking at the direct and the indirect uh, costs, whether it's physician costs, drugs, hospitalizations, etc. So we, what we found is there's uh, quite a range, actually. So the estimates of economic burden of obesity in Canada range from 4.6 uh, billion to 7.1 billion annually, depending on which study you looked at. So definitely we need a better understanding of the contributions of obesity to both mortality and morbidity and that would help us get more uh, accurate economic costs because we really do need these when we're making business cases. The uh, next section that we looked at was opportunities for interventions. So we were able to look in the literature to see what is it that you can do about obesity and what interventions are out there. So we categorized them into three different categories. And the first one being health services and clinical interventions that target individuals. The second one being community level interventions in key settings, things like broad uh, educational outreach uh, that influence behaviors. And then the third one being public policies that target a broader social and environmental determinant. So a little more detail on each of those in terms of the clinical practice guidelines. Um, it's, it looks at tailoring to the patients and include one or more of the following. So behavior modification, dietary interventions, physical activity, and even bariatric surgery. The community-based obesity interventions, uh, we looked at things like ACNAL BC and participation as examples, others that are delivered in the community and in settings such as workplaces and schools. And then the third category, category, the public policy approaches, things such as regulations on food labeling and marketing to children, and looking at obesity at the population level. So uh, in summer, we know that obesity is complex. We know that there isn't one single solution that will reverse this tide of, of uh, increasing uh, prevalence of obesity in Canada. And we do need a, a comprehensive, multifaceted sectorial approach to try and tackle it. So we released this report, as I mentioned, in June of this year. It certainly uh, sparked some debate across the country. It got people talking about it and looking at some of the facts that, that hadn't been uh, uh, known previously. And certainly the report was meant to examine prevalence and risk factors associated with obesity at the population level. Not to be meant as a clinical tool and, and an individual prescription, but it seems that it has added to the lit literature out there and we're pleased to have done that. So I'll uh, look forward to your questions as part of this WebEx and uh, speaker.